Welcome, Ty. Well, thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. For those viewers not familiar with McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario, or its Innovation Park, or indeed the workings and importance of university-led research and innovation ecosystems, I think it's important to provide some background. So let's begin with the fundamental understanding of what value an academic institution like McMaster would have economically in its collaboration with private industry beyond their education of future knowledge workers. Right, well, if you look at things at a macro level, uh, if you think about what does a company need to grow, um, outside of capital, it really, really needs three things. Number one, it needs markets to sell your products and services into. Um, it needs new ideas, new ideas for your products, new ideas for how you sell those products, new ideas for how you produce and service those products. And then the third thing is you need talent uh, in order to do those three things. So what a university uh, and colleges do is they offer two of those things. Um, they offer ideas, um, and they're also a source, obviously, for talent, as you, as you pointed out. And so those are the things that they bring to bear uh, from an economic growth perspective. And the purpose of a research park is to facilitate that. So universities are brilliant at doing research and teaching. The purpose of a research park is to take those raw ideas and act as a bridge or a transition zone, if you will, um, to advance them to a point where industry or investors want to, you know, can incorporate them into a product. And so our purpose is to, is to be that bridge, to take brilliant ideas and transform in, them into impactful, impactful uh, business realities. What are some of the challenges that uh, a university like McMaster would have in fostering commercial applications for the research, doing the things that you've just referred to? So, so let me say that, um, I, again, a university is focused on research. Their, their goal is to come up with that brilliant discovery. Um, the, the issue is that companies, businesses, and consumers, you don't buy ideas. You don't go to Walmart and go to a shelf and say, I'm going to buy that idea. So intellectual property or brilliant research only creates economic value when it's incorporated into a product or service. And so what you have is uh, universities and colleges generating ideas, and then, but you have businesses that want to buy products and services, and there, there becomes a gap. And so the challenge is how do you curate and advance raw ideas, as brilliant as they are, to a point where some consumer, be that a, an individual or a business, would say, ah, I, I know how to generate economic value out of that. And that's where research comes into play. One of the concepts, of course, across this business spectrum that is often talked about by leaders is the challenge and, and problem of culture and its alignment with business strategy. To what extent is the academic culture an obstacle to doing just that in terms of the interconnection between the university's generation of ideas and the commercialization of that technology? Well, I, I, w I don't want to say that university or academic culture is a, an impediment it's, it's part of the ecosystem. You know, universities are an 800-year-old invention, um, and so they're somewhat fixed in their ways. And, and let's be clear that people that went into academia chose to go into academia. They didn't chose to go into, uh, choose to go into business. Um, and so our purpose as a research park is not to turn uh, a university into a business, nor is our purpose to take academics who very specifically chose to stay in academia to turn them into businesses or entrepreneurs. Our job is to promote collaboration between academic, academia and industry. And so the cultural challenge is really about finding overlap and alignment. What I think if you kind of look at the culture, uh, the commonalities of culture, uh, academia very much wants to have an impact on the world. If you think about McMaster's Brighter World uh, initiative, it's all about how do you impact the world in a positive way. Well, similarly, industry and business is, is trying to have an impact as well. There, there's a whole theme about, uh, about impact investing. So they have that in common. So culturally, the challenge is to say, listen, we don't want to turn... Uh, every academic into a business person, nor do we want to turn business into academia. But what we do have in common, culturally, is a real passion for having an impact. 
And so the cultural challenge is getting alignment between different cultures and taking advantage of their relative strengths as opposed to just making one homogeneous. So it's cultural alignment that spans institutions, regions, and, and stuff. That's the culture, cultural challenge. So we'll return to that in a second, but I think if we're going to explore this particular challenge in the context of McMaster University in, in Hamilton, Ontario, we should talk about McMaster's academic and research strengths. Mm -hmm. Can you describe those for us? So let me say that McMaster as a whole is, uh, is, a, is a research powerhouse. Uh, the university leads the country um, in industry-led research, in absolute dollars. And in relative dollars, it is the most research intensive university in the country. So it is a research powerhouse and they do all sorts of things. If you kind of wanted to pick the three that are most applicable uh, to industry and, and from a commercialization perspective, it would be life sciences and biotech. Uh, we have a huge life science school at, at McMaster. Um, the second would be advanced manufacturing. And advanced manufacturing unto itself is broad because it could be advanced manufacturing in biotech or in automotive, in aerospace, in all sorts of things. And then the, the third category is uh, ICT or the, kind of the software stuff. Uh, so that's another area. That third pillar, though, is really applied to the first two pillars. So the, the way I ask people to describe it or think about it is, you know, everybody talks about AI, for example. So if you want to find who's doing research on the next generation of AI algorithms, stuff that maybe has commercial applicability in 15 years, frankly, don't come here. I would go check out MIT or in the Canadian context, go check out some of the amazing things being done in downtown Toronto. But if you want to know who's applying AI, you know, state-of-the-art AI, technologies to real world commercial problems today, such as in automotive and aerospace and life sciences, you come here. So the research priorities, again, are life sciences, uh, advanced manufacturing, and ICT, with that third pillar really being a support pillar of the first two. So the, uh, the mediating element, the institution or group that you lead that serves this purpose is, of course, McMaster's Innovation Park, where we're currently located. And I'd like to start with a little bit of the biography for the park. Can you tell us when it was first established? So as a research park, it opened 12, 12 years ago. Um, but it stands on a legacy over 100, 100 years old. Um, so the park itself uh, sits on a 53-acre campus that was an old, uh, an old Westinghouse campus. Uh, you know, the original building was built in 1913. Uh, during the First and Second World uh, Wars, they made torpedoes and tanks uh, at the park. Uh, some of the amazing companies that you might be aware of, for example, uh, you're familiar with L3 Westcam. Westcam stands for Westinghouse Camera. It was actually invented in this building on the third floor. Um, and now it's a pillar of, of technology, the largest technology employer in the region. Also, Genom, which is now Semtech, uh, revolutionized digital hearing aids. Again, that was a Wesson House invention that occurred in this actual building. Okay. And so while the park is only 12 years old, really stands on the shoulders of over 100 years of innovation. About 15 years ago, Genom, uh, not Genom, I'm sorry, uh, Wesson House, uh, uh, under, the, under the brand name Camco, uh, sold off the properties, put it up for sale, and the university acquired the land uh, they, after three years of renovation, so they turned this building, which was a factory and a little dusty, and they turned it into the first building of the research park, and they opened up 12 years ago. So uh, why don't you then describe for us the park as it exists today in its size and in its functioning? So again, it's a 53-acre campus. One-third of that campus has been developed. Um, uh, there's 513,000 square feet under management. It's focused really, this is kind of the main hub of the building. This is where you're going to find most of the support resources, um, whether it's financiers or incubators, accelerators. We're home for Innovation Factory, which is a regional innovation center for the Hamilton area. We're home for the Forge. Uh, we're home for Ontario Centers of Excellence funding for the IRAP group. So this is kind of 
the hub. In addition to that, we have CANMET, which is a national laboratory uh, for material science. Uh, we also have what we refer to as the warehouse, which is just across the street. While we say it's a warehouse, it's actually comprised of a number of buildings. On one end, it's Bean Center, the biomedical engineering facility. Um, on the other end is MARC, which is the McMaster Automotive Resource Center, the largest automotive uh, research center in North America. And two more facilities that are in the process of being built. A commercialization zone for, uh, for life sciences and an advanced manufacturing center. That's where we sit here today. Two new buildings are about to uh, uh, break ground, one of which is uh, a new emerging technology center where gallons will be the anchor tenant, which you're well familiar with and a brand new hotel. So that's kind of where we sit here today. When you look at the, the park as it exists now and compare it to other institutions across uh, the country that seem to be serving similar functions, how would you compare and contrast this park and its approach to such entities as Communitech, Mars, or DMZ? So, so I think we all have a similar uh, mission, if you will, which is to help companies grow. Let's talk about Communitech and Mars. Those are probably the best two known uh, entities out there. They're both uh, what are known as RICs or regional innovation centers. So they have, we have an equivalent of that, which is Innovation Factory. Uh, certainly Mars and Communitech are bigger and better known, but from a pure content delivery and function, uh, our partners in Innovation Factory do the same. W what I would say is unique about the park is that the RICs are very focused on startups, and, and that's important. Startups are one commercial mechanism to bring an idea to commercial reality, to commercialize stuff, but not the only, uh, uh, not the only option. Sometimes you want to partner with a large-scale company. Uh, in our case, it would be a Pfizer or a Fiat Chrysler or some other company that's already well-established. Um, and and a, another group would be the mid-market or small-medium-sized companies. So while Community Tech and Mars are really focused on the startup zone, what's different in MIP is we have that, plus we have a focus on large-scale companies and medium-sized companies. Um, and I think that's where it differentiates us. One of the things that I like to draw people's attention to is, uh, I'll give you a stat that I find interesting. In 2017, 80% of Canada's economic growth came from only 1.6% of Canadian companies. And when you look at those 1.6% of companies that generated all this growth, none of them were startups, nor were any of them large scale companies, multinationals. They were all mid-market, small, medium-sized enterprises. So as we sit, and so that mid-market SME sector is the engine of the Canadian economy. It's very unique for Canada that that's the engine. But that's the way it is. And so if we want to impact the economy by helping companies grow, that's the biggest part of the econ Canadian economy. And so we have a, a strong focus on, on supporting mid-market, small, medium-sized companies. And that's very unique uh, in the Canadian context. And I would argue it's very unique in, in a global context. You're coming up now on your first anniversary as CEO of the park. The search that led to your hiring was a pivotal one for McMaster in the evolution of the park tie, and one that saw, as I recall, a considerable number of very credentialed leaders seek the role. Why did you want to be the next CEO of this park? <laughs> so, you know what? I, you probably have more insight into who the, uh, who the competition was than, than I do. Um, you know what, Lou? It, it, was, it was kind of like planned serendipity, if you will. Um, I think you know that uh, I've got a little bit of a history at the park. Uh, when the park first opened 12 years ago, uh, Triveris, which I was a partner in, uh, was a founding tenant. We were a venture capital company situated actually right here as we sit. The, the boardroom across the way was our boardroom. So let me say that I, have, I drank the Kool-Aid uh, from the very beginning about a, what a research park uh, could and should do for the Hamilton area. Um, at the time, I never envisioned that I would actually be part of it. My career started as an engineer designing products, morphed, I went to the dark side and went into business and investment and went from designing products to designing businesses. And so when the headhunter that was doing the search called, at first I thought it was a bit odd. I was like, well, 
isn't it really just a real estate facilities management play? And I am not one of those folks. But what they shared with me is that the university and the board of directors really wanted to, to have a big, new, bold strategic vision. And they wanted it to be focused not just on the real estate, but on how do you leverage that real estate towards the strategic purpose to be that bridge. And so, you know what? Uh, that idea grew on me and it grew on me. And so I went back to them and I said, you know, if you're serious about this, if you really want to do this, this sounds like a really exciting project. And I go from suddenly being a, an engineer designing products to a business guy, you know, designing businesses to, to a guy designing ecosystems. It seemed like a natural evolution. It took a little while for that to sink in, but over time I got really jazzed about it. Um, and you know what, the board, the board was keen about it as well. And you know, it's been a, a very interesting year ever since. So having been onboarded, what were the immediate challenges that you identified as necessary to overcome? You know, I, I think as I look at, at the park and the broader ecosystem, I think one of the bigger things is just, and we need to walk with a swagger. We do amazing things in Hamilton in the region. McMaster does amazing things from a research priority. Mohawk does amazing things from a college research. The city itself is phenomenal. It just strikes me that we've forever been, Hamilton has forever been the city of, of potential that's never realized. And what I realized in joining the park a year ago is that there's a bunch of uh, new leaders, including yourself, uh, both as individuals and institutions, that are really starting to focus on how do we bring that potential to life? For me, at the park, I think the biggest challenge was to get people excited about, you know what, we should and we can and should play a major role in that. And to articulate a vision uh, that was clear, concise, and compelling that moved us out of, gosh, are we a landlord to a bunch of companies, to we're playing a leadership role. And that cultural challenge within the organizational self, kind of letting them, you know, it's not something that I needed to other than kind of let them free, let them be free to do what they've always been thinking about. So that was the major thing. I have to say that the board and everybody I've met was hugely supportive. So it wasn't, you know, incredibly hard other than to try to galvanize what everybody wanted and to take a bunch of thoughts that perhaps uh, hadn't been condensed into something clear, concise and compelling. But we did that. We put a strategy together and everybody said, yeah, that's what we want to do. Um, and then you take advantage of the natural motivation that they already have. So, but the biggest thing was to just get people to go, you know what, we can do that and I want to be part of it. And so that was the major challenge for the first year. Now we have the daunting task, of course, we got to do all these crazy things, but that's okay. We'll get to that in a second, but you did allude to some of the other regional actors and regional assets that will be key to the success of this venture in the region generally. And you touched on a couple of them. I'd like to explore that a little bit further with you. Uh, because it is a region that is uniquely gifted in terms of some of the institutions that, that, that uh, are found here. Can you, can you describe for that what you think those are uh, and how you would propose and aspire to work with them more effectively to get us all where we need to be? Yeah, so maybe before listing them, let, let's talk about uh, ecosystems. So ecosystems are, it's a very common phrase. Everybody talks about, well, we're developing an ecosystem. Um, but if you actually ask somebody to say, well, what is an ecosystem and who's part of it, a lot of people's eyes kind of glaze over. Um, you can describe a biological ecosystem, which is, you know, grasshoppers eat grass, and rabbits eat grasshoppers, and foxes eat, gra you know, rabbits, and so on and so forth. But overall, an ecosystem is the environment or that, that entities operate in, and it becomes sustainable. So when you look at the Hamilton ecosystem, there's a whole bunch of, uh, of amazing things that are here, frankly, enough to have a critical mass. From an educational perspective, we obviously have McMaster and Mohawk, two of the leading uh, academic inst institutions in Canada for the generation of ideas. 
But that's part of it. What other things do we have? Well, we have Hamilton Health Sciences, right? Uh, we have St. Joe's. So we have, you know, we have not just a place where life sciences are taught and researched, but actually where they're practiced. Um, and we also have a bunch of, uh, speaking of advanced manufacturing, from the Stelco to the classic ArcelorMittal, we have businesses that rely on advanced manufacturing have been building on that. So some of the things that are also out there um, that we need to complement are, are capital. So we need to attract capital, whether we like it or not in, a, in, in, in our environment, capital is what makes ideas flow between entities. And so you ask, well, what makes capital flow? Well, there's certainly investors, but then there's support organizations. So Gowlings is a great example that you play a, a critical role in that, whether it's access to clients or capital or, or any of the things that you need, not just locally, but globally, there's there. The trick is not, do you have the pieces? It's kind of like having a bag of Lego. You actually have to put them together before you make something that accomplishes uh, a function. And so what I would say is we've got all those pieces. What we as a group are doing is trying to fit them together so that the whole is greater than the sum of the, the, the parts. And it's really about that alignment of culture. And so one of the things that I would say is introducing the business arm or the business piece of Hamilton into the public and pro public sector is something that we need to go because our real goal is to create impactful private companies and so we have to create or introduce the the private players into the ecosystem and and get some alignment there well that's a great segue then into your vision and strategy for the park's future and fostering that connection and, and the assembly of those lego pieces into a coherent whole that functions how is it that you're proposing to do that? Describe for me what you're thinking about in, in relation to that issue. So it, the phrase that I've borrowed from The Economist is something called spatial alchemy. Um, and it's the notion that it's, it's the art and science of creating that magical mix of people, passions, capabilities, um, where magic happens. What I want to say is it, it's creating that environment. The ecosystem, again, is the environment. So just like a learning institution, or, or frankly, any entity, you know, I, you can't go, you know, by force of will, you know, create an idea or force an idea to come, come together. What we can do, though, is create a, an environment that facilitates that. And so what we want to do under the, under the banner of spatial alchemy is, is really three things. Number one is we, have, we want to have the right mix of people, companies, and talents. By that I mean, and let's use a company analogy. Have you ever heard, I'll pick on, pick on the legal system, have you ever heard of a, any successful company that was comprised entirely of lawyers? Even within your legal firm, you have administrative people, if you have marketing people, you have facilities people, you have, you have different talents. Well, why is that? Because to, to work as a company, to succeed, you need different, different diverse set of skills and capabilities. Just like in a hockey team, you can't have all left wingers and expect to win the Stanley Cup. So the park has that similar, what is the right mix of capabilities in order to bring an idea to life? We have strong technical talent in the form of researchers and engineers, but now we have to complement it with other stuff. We need to bring capital to the park. We need to bring legal to the park. We need to bring regulatory folks to the park. We need creative disciplines that can help us tell the stories. So the first strategy under spatial alchemy is to change the mix to have a broader set of capabilities. And that means bringing different companies and different individuals to the park with a different set of, uh, of skills. One of the biggest pieces is that we need capital. Right, so we need to have, you know, whether they're venture capitalists or private equity or commercial banking, we need them here, whether they reside here or they visit here, we need those here. The second now, the second strategy is, okay, let's assume that we have a good mix. How do we animate, how do we animate it so that they, they come, to, come together? Uh, you know, you asked about a challenge, so it's a silly analogy, but when I arrived here about a year ago, the park reminded me of a, 
uh, well, did you ever go to a dance when you were grade seven or eight? Sure. Right? Yeah. And I see that, you know, that cringe that we all share. You know, let me tell you my story. So, you know, when I went to my first dance in grade seven, before I went, I imagined that it would be all this dancing, it'd be like on television movies. I was going to meet Molly Ringwald, it was going to be amazing. Um, but when I went, you know, there was a few, you know, it was in the gym, they dimmed the lights a bit, there was some streamers and balloons, but there wasn't a whole lot of dancing, right? Instead, all the boys were lined up on one side of the gym and all the girls on the other side of the gym. Um, you know, and then there, then there was the jocks and the troublemakers and the nerds like me. And we kind of sat there. We didn't get out and dance. Um, and so after an hour and a half of kind of sitting in the gym, not talking to anybody, I slunked away, you know, thinking, well, that's not what I expected. What does that have to do with the park? Well, first and foremost, you have to invite people to the dance. I described how we're going to do that. The second is how do we, how do we effectively spike the punch so that, you know, all those engineers and scientists get out and start to mingle or collide, which is the modern vernacular, with other folks. Well, you do that through programming, so that you do that through events, whether it's speakers, you do that through some sports, such as, you know, sounds silly, but bocce ball and stuff like that, or concerts or anything. I mean, you do that through amenities, so that people are brought together. There's a whole theory about how innovation occurs in coffee shops the whole process by which you and I happen to be in line at, you know, to get our coffee in the morning and we say, hey, you know, I had this idea. So what we're trying to do under the second pillar is to animate the park by providing amenities and programming such that this diverse mix of people start to collide and ultimately collaborate. And then the third pillar is frankly to promote what's going on at the park. As I said, there's amazing things going on here and we need to market ourselves. We need to market ourselves to the community so that they realize what's going on here. We need to market ourselves to the universities and colleges, McMaster and Mohawk, so that they know what we offer. We need to market ourselves to the globe because we have amazing things to bring to the world. But most importantly, we need to market to ourselves. Um, we need to believe that we are as remarkable as we are and kind of walk with that swagger. So when we get out on that dance floor, uh, you know, we're not doing it with our tail between our legs. And so again, you know, change the mix, animate the park, promote. Those are the three strategies. An increasing area of focus corporately around the world, particularly in such areas as recruitment and branding, is the resolve to create value around positive social impact. And in describing for me the ways in which you're proposing to do that, the output at the end of the day would, would seek to really leverage McMaster's advantage and profile as being a university that has global leadership around positive social impact. How do you see the work of the park focusing and leveraging on that ambition and aspiration going forward? Right. Well, again, you pointed out, but McMaster, um, I think they were ranked number two on impactful universities in the world. Number two, um, that's a remarkable thing. And so being part of the McMaster family, we need and want to be part of that. Remember, we're the commercial arm of that. So the question that we're trying to do is, well, how do we, how do we impact the world from a commercial, from a business perspective? Um, what I would say is, and there's a whole theme that's going around here, it, you know, there's a strategy, a thought that the world's biggest problems are also the biggest profit opportunities. Personally, I think that, you know, capitalism and business for a long time has had kind of a negative uh, view from, from some folks. And that's partly because, frankly, a lot of businesses are all about how do I take advantage of the ecosystem? How do I drain as opposed to, to uh, put back in? But a lot of modern thinking is that you really can have your cake and eat it too that you can create a business, but that business exists in an ecosystem. And if it's an unhealthy ecosystem, then eventually it's going to be problematic. So, so today's world, whether it's triple bottom line or the notion of balanced scorecards, is that businesses are judged not just are they profitable and sustainable financially, but are they profitable and sustainable on a whole other dimension. And that's absolutely what we're trying to, to support. If you look at... Uh, uh, you know, the Faculty of Engineering, their School of Entre Entrepreneurship is all about sustainable entrepreneurism. 
So the notion of how do you not just go in there, flip something for a quick profit, but how do you do good? And so, you know, I would argue, you know, there's a phrase I heard uh, recently, sort of an unapologetically Canadian approach to doing well by doing good. And, and I think that's what we're trying to do at the park is to instill folks, yes, this is a business, a place to do business, but business could, can and should be doing good for the community and for the world itself. And we're trying to instill that into our companies. So let's, let's talk for a few minutes about the university and the Innovation Park's relationship with the Gowling WLG law firm. Uh, while in its early days and, and not yet widely communicated, the university and this law firm have partnered really to advance the ambition that you've articulated. Um, and with a view also clearly to commercialize technology uh, and, and to help the region and McMaster and other private entities benefit from the, the university's research. Now, in doing that, we've co-developed the construction of a facility at the Innovation Park, which you referred to earlier, which will be home to our office in this region, from which we hope the partnership will evolve. The commitment that the firm has made to do this with you um, is really to leverage our law firm's global network of relationships to support the, the vision and ambition that you have. Can you explore with me how you see taking advantage of that partnership and that network to fulfill the objectives that you have as the CEO of the park? Sure. Let, let me go to what I said earlier about the first pillar of our, of our go forward strategy is getting diversity, right? Diversity on all dimensions. And what I would suggest is that as we're trying to attract other companies, groups to the park, even if they're in a different domain, um, such as the legal profession um, or in food and beverages or anything, we want them to be innovators. So it's not like we want to be innovative, but just in the areas where we wear white lab coats, but we're going to be, you know, old fashioned and everything else. We want the park to be comprised of innovators in all of their own domain. And innovator, innovation is not the sole domain of researchers and engineers. It can be anything. And, and I think, as you're well aware, look, Galling is, Gallings is an innovator in its own domain. And so number one, from a cultural perspective, it's a perfect fit. Number two, but where does that fit within the broader context? I would say, you know, certainly there's legal services that are required by the companies here. That, that's, that's obvious, but we need to take advantage of it. I think what's more exciting is the global network that you bring to the table. You know, we often think about innovation as a technology. But there's kind of a, a law of innovation that says for every technical innovation, there has to be a corresponding business model innovation to bring it to life. Otherwise, it's just, just an idea. And that means you need to find a business partner or a business vehicle to bring it to life. The research that's done at McMaster, for example, the researchers in, in health sciences are not trying to solve cancer for Hamilton. They're trying to solve cancer for the world. And so the right commercial partner for any given discovery, it could be in Hamilton, could be in Dubai, could be in Beijing, could be anywhere in the world. And so we need to have a global uh, network to reach out to so that when you have an idea, we can find where are the problems that can be solved with that idea and where are the right commercial partners. As a research park, you know, we don't have that. We have some of a global network. What do you guys have? You have a global network. And so the idea that by combining your global network to people with problems, to people with expertise in those geographies, um, is, is an absolutely, not, not only is it a great idea, it's essential to connect our brilliant ideas and researchers to problem spaces anywhere in the world. If our mission is to impact the world with these to make a brighter world, it's not a brighter Hamilton, it's a brighter world. Well, then we need partners across the globe. And you guys really represent um, a global partnership that gives us reach to the entire world. And to me, that's, that's the brilliant thing. So uh, as you and I both know from many long discussions, the idea of collaborating in this fashion is quite innovative in and of itself. Um, and it also requires that 
not just you, but those within a law firm behave in a slightly different way because the ambition and aspiration is, is to facilitate connection, which in and of itself isn't something that necessarily generates revenue. We hope by doing that to be a trusted partner and to put our clients together in a way that gives us the opportunity to service those interests downstream. If you had to make the business case to my colleagues around the world of the, the importance in doing this for our business, for the legal business and the success and, and health of our, of our firm, how would you make that argument? What's in it for us to the extent that my colleagues need to know what that is? Well, you know, I think it was Wayne Gretzky that said, the great philosopher. The great philosopher Wayne Gretzky said, you know, the, the secret to success is to not skate where the puck is, but to skate where the puck is going. Frankly, what we're doing here at the park is defining where the puck is going in life sciences and advanced manufacturing in so many areas. And so as a legal firm, if you want to grow, which you obviously do, and you want to create value both for yourselves and your for clients, you know, what's the equivalent of skating to where the puck is? So you're gonna see emerging technologies, emerging businesses in emerging geographies. So it's an opportunity to participate in where the puck is being shot to and to participate in it um, as opposed to being reactive. So it's an opportunity um, for you guys to participate in that definition and in the growth as opposed to being reactive. And I, I know that's a very high level, um, but you get to define the future, participate in crafting the future, and then participate in the business that comes out of that. So looking ahead then, Ty, seven to 10 years down the road, as you see um, the strategies that you've created to advance the vision begin to come together, how would you describe success for you and the park? So I'm going to add one more dimension. I'm going to say for the, for the region. Okay, so. Our success, let me be clear, our, our job at the park is to help companies grow. Gowlings is one of those companies. Um, and so we have no success beyond the success of our partners. And so what is the success of the park looks like? Well, certainly it's expanded you know, facilities and expanded park, but more importantly, it's successful companies. So 10 years from now, what I would hope is the companies at the park, including Gowlins, including the companies that are being built out of the Forge and Innovation Factory today, including the companies that are going to come take, take up residence in the park, um, including companies all over the city and the region, have benefited from the growth. So they look back and say, you know what, um, you know, MIP helped them grow. That's our mission. And I would argue, you know, in my happy place, that the park is viewed as a global leader in how to transform brilliant ideas into commercial realities. What we're doing is hard. There is no recipe book. It's not like you go to the local bookstore or your Kindle store and say, you know, buy a recipe book for how to do this. We're figuring this out together. And so I think the hallmark of success is can we transform the park, the companies at the park and the region that we're in uh, to demonstrate corporate growth and the economic prosperity that comes from that. And, you know, I'd love to see a Harvard business uh, study about how we did it from 10 years from now. Well, maybe they'll write one someday. That's the, that's the plan. Yeah. Ty Shattuck, thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much for having us. And thank you for, uh, for being part of this revolution, Lou. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Accelerating Business Podcast, powered by Galling WLG. If you'd like to be a guest or for more information, please visit GowlingWLG.com Accelerate Podcast.